In the last lecture, we outlined the general issues we need to consider to understand how a single cell can develop into a complex organism. In this lecture, we're going to begin to look at these issues in a little bit more detail. Specifically, we'll start today by describing the earliest phases of development in animals to see how that first cell starts the process and understand how the initial ground plan, if you will, of a developing organism gets put together. Of course, there are considerable differences among different kinds of animals in the details of how development proceeds. But at the same time, and fortunately for our discussion, the very earliest stages of development share much in common across all sorts of animals, from sea urchins to fruit flies to frogs and to humans. To help us understand the fundamental principles of development, I'm going to de-emphasize the differences among different kinds of animals in this lecture and instead draw on what we know from a few particularly well-studied group of organisms that will allow us to sort of create a generic view of early development. Now, the first step in the development of a sexually reproducing organism is fertilization, the creation of the zygote from the merger of a female gamete with a male gamete an egg and a sperm. The process of fertilization is far from random. That is, it doesn't occur simply when a sperm happens to encounter an egg. The ability of a sperm to penetrate that egg depends on a complex set of recognition mechanisms involving cell signaling and, and responses that ensure that only a single sperm of the right type will be able to fertilize an egg. We're not going to talk about that today. But what I want to point out is that the most important thing, thing to understand about fertilization is that it initiates a series of events that contribute to the zygote becoming an inherently asymmetric cell. Actually, in many species, the unfertilized egg is also asymmetric. What this means is that its cellular components are not evenly distributed throughout the cell. There might be more on one side of the cell than the other. The entry of the sperm into the cell actually usually causes an additional rearrangement of the cellular contents of that egg, um, enhancing again the asymmetry of the now fertilized zygote. The most important asymmetry, as we'll see, is going to be in the distribution of messenger RNAs and proteins, the so-called maternal determinants or cytoplasmic determinants that we mentioned last time that are put into the egg by the mother. Now, in some organisms, the asymmetry of an egg or a zygote is actually very visual, visually apparent because it's associated with an equally asymmetric distribution of yolk. This yolk can be observed under a microscope because it usually is colored in a different way. Yolk is simply um, stored fats and other nutrients that the developing embryo will be using uh, to nourish itself when it grows. Now, to classical embryologists, those people who were first describing development back in the 19th century, the end of a zygote that contained yolk became known as the vegetal pole. Not the vegetable pole, the vegetal pole. <laughs> And excuse me if I make a mistake later on. It's a tough one. The opposite end that had less or no yolk became known as the animal pole. Now, we're less interested in the distribution of yolk than we are in the distribution of those proteins and mRNAs that I just mentioned. But the idea of an animal pole and a vegetal pole is useful because we can begin to picture the zygote as something like a globe, say a model of the planet with a different north and south pole, or a different animal and vegetable, the vegetal pole that sort of defines a polarity of that uh, structure. Even those zygotes of animals that don't contain obvious visible, visible yolk still have an asymmetric distribution of these proteins and mRNAs that are important to us. We'll see that the reason this is important is because it provides, this asymmetry provides one of the important sources of information that causes the cells produced when that zygote divides to begin to diversify. Now, after fertilization occurs, of course, the next thing that happens in all developing organisms is that the zygote begins to divide. 
The division that the zygote goes under it, uh, undergoes at this time, we call cleavage. Cleavage is actually different from normal cell division in a couple of ways. It is a kind of mitosis, with the DNA in the nucleus of the cell being replicated with each division and then being divided appropriately between the two daughter cells. Those daughter cells, by the way, in cleavage, we generally call blastomeres. Now, the thing that's interesting about cleavage, there are a few things I want to point out. First, the cell divisions, the very first cell divisions that occur during cleavage follow a very orderly pattern with respect to the orientation of the cells. That is, the orientation relative to animal and vegetal poles. And it depends on the plane along which they divide. Consider, for example, the sea urchin which is a very good model system. It's been used uh, really for over 100 years as a main model system in studies of developmental biology. The very first division that changes the zygote, that takes the zygote from one cell to two cell, occurs along what would be a longitudinal axis of that cell. That is, if we think of it as a globe, it would be like a line of longitude running around the axis from north to south pole. Now, if you remember back to our discussion of mitosis, you remember that during cell division, during mitosis, the chromosomes will line up in the middle of the cell along what we might call the metaphase plate, because in the metaphase part of mitosis, the chromosomes are all lined up, and then they'll eventually divide and be separated into two cells. So in this case of the first cell division of cleavage in the sea urchin, the metaphase plate is essentially running along that longitudinal line because that metaphase plate will define the place where the cell gets pinched off in cytokinesis. That's the process by which the two new cells are created. And now, after that first division, we have two cells that have the same orientation if there's an asymmetry of animal and vegetal pole that the original zygote had. Why? If you begin to think about this as in terms of a globe with a North Pole and the South Pole, if we could pinch apart the globe along this longitudinal axis and said, now in these two new globes, where's the relative North and South Pole? They would be the same for those two globes. The second division of um, uh, cleavage in the sea urchin occurs along a longitudinal plane again. And now we have four cells, again, maintaining the same initial asymmetry. However, in the third round of cell division, when we go from four cells to eight cells, the orientation of the cell division plane shifts. Instead of the cells dividing along a longitudinal axis, they instead divide along what would essentially be the equator of the globe. That is, they shift from a longitudinal axis of division to an equatorial axis. Now, the details of exactly which cells are dividing along which axis isn't really what's important for us to understand here. We don't need to remember those details. Now, I'll remind you about them again as they become important later. And in fact, different groups of animals follow different patterns of division. The important point is that this first set of cell divisions during cleavage do follow some specific pattern of orientation. Now, to understand why this is important, recall again that the contents of the zygote are asymmetrically distributed. Those are the proteins and messenger RNAs that are unequal in different parts of the cell. Depending on the orientation of cell division during cleavage with respect to that asymmetry, the original asymmetry of the parent cell either will or will not be maintained in the daughters. Again, to get a better idea of what I mean by this, picture the zygote as a globe one more time. Now imagine there's a gradient of, say, some protein that's running from the north to the south pole, from the animal to the vegetal pole, with lots of this protein found in the north pole and progressively less of it found as you move further south or towards the vegetal pole in the plane. If we divided this cell along the longitudinal plane, that is, dividing the cell along a line that runs between the poles, then that runs around the poles, from the north pole to the south pole, the animal pole to the vegetal pole, then the, re the resulting daughter cells will retain the same asymmetric distribution of that protein, with the north half, the animal half, having, mo um, having more, and the south or vegetal half having less of that protein. But, and here's the key point, if instead we divide this cell along its equator, 
then the resulting daughter cells will be fundamentally different from the parent cell. One of the daughter cells, the one that's on the top, that's more northward, that one on the top will have more of the protein that we're interested in because that's where it was originally concentrated, whereas the cell on the bottom resulting from that di division will have less of that protein. And so you can see that the regular pattern will maybe or maybe not change the nature of the cellular contents. And so after these first few divisions of cleavage, we now have cells that, although they have the same genomes, have, may have different cytoplasmic contents. And as we'll see, this becomes important in the first step in which the subsequent fate of those cells is determined in the developing organism. Now, another characteristic of cleavage is that there's no net increase in the volume of cytoplasm uh, during cell, between cell divisions. That is, the cells divide, but they don't grow. And as a result, actually, cell division occurs very rapidly um, uh, in cleavage. By one estimate, for example, a frog zygote will divide into over 37,000 cells in just 43 hours. So very rapid cell division. But because they don't grow, what it really means is that the cells become progressively smaller so that with each division, the overall size of the structure is about the same as the size of the original zygote, but all the cells become smaller and smaller and smaller. There's more of them. The point here is that what these cleavages are doing is not really be, uh, uh, growing the organism, but essentially just dividing up and repackaging the cytoplasm, again, potentially creating asymmetries. Now, one final feature of cleavage that I need to mention at this point is that in most organisms, the genes of the developing organism itself, that is, the genes in the zygote, actually aren't expressed at all. They're not transcribed. The DNA of the zygote is not transcribed. It's replicated with each division, and the replicates, the duplicate copies of the DNA, are passed on to the daughter blastomeres as cleavage occurs. But no transcription occurs. In other words, no messenger RNA from that individual itself is produced. This finding actually suggests that cleavage must be entirely under control of those maternal determinants, the proteins and messenger RNAs that were packed into the zygote by the mother originally. And this is a point that we're going to come back to in the next lecture. Now, after some number of cleavages have occurred, the developing organism eventually turns into a, what would look like a small solid ball of cells. We call that ball of cells the morula. Uh, this is actually the Latin name for mulberry, which is a, a little berry that looks something like a raspberry, because in fact, you know, the structure just looks like a whole bunch of little cells, it looks like a bumpy little raspberry. Hence, it's called the morula. Then, as the morula continues to have more divisions, as it grows, or as it divides more, it's not really getting much bigger, a fluid-filled cavity begins to develop inside this ball of cell, forming what's now really a hollow ball. And we call this hollow ball the blastula. Now, I'm throwing a few terms at you here because I think it's important to use these terms, or it will be important to use these terms later on to explain further stages in um, development. So the blastula stage is the stage where the developing organism now has become a small hollow ball of cells. These cells are in a single sheet around the ball. The inner space of this hollow ball, by the way, is what we call the blastocele. That's really just the cavity inside the um, uh, blastula. And the sheet of cells that actually make up the blastula, that single sheet of cells, is called the blastoderm. Okay, I'll mention these terms now because they come in handy later. So where have we gotten so far? We began with a single large cell, a zygote, and we've ended up now with a hollow ball of what might be at least several hundred, or in some cases several thousand very small cells, the, the blastula. Up to this point, the process of cell division has really been the main mechanism or process responsible for the changes we've observed in the appearance of the developing embryo. To some extent, the process of cell differentiation has also begun to be set up as a consequence of that particular set of orientations of cell divisions resulting in unequal distributions of the cellular contents. 
But in many ways, not much has happened. All we have is a ball of cells, and at this point, those cells all more or less look the same. But the next stage in embryogenesis, the development of an embryo, which we call gastrulation, is when the real action begins. Because it's here where the details of how the, um, where it's here where the basic ground plan of the developing organism becomes established. Now, as with these earlier stages of development, the way gastrulation specifically proceeds differs among different kinds of animals, even more so actually than what we would see in cleavage in the formulation of the blastula. But I want to simplify by pointing out what is in common in gastrulation. Gastrulation in all animals shares a common set of mechanisms by which the cells in the developing organisms are dramatically rearranged into different positions, creating a much more complex structure out of what was just a hollow ball of cells. With the onset of gastrulation, the process of morphogenesis that I introduced last time becomes particularly important, along with further cell division and further cell differentiation. Gastrulation involves three major morphological landmarks. First, some cells move from the surface of the blastula, the blastoderm, into the interior of the hollow ball, into the blastocele. Second, as a consequence of these movements, three distinctive layers, three different kinds of cells, now become established in the embryo. And third, by the end of gastrulation, we have what we would call an embryo with an internal digestive cavity that's connected to the outside. And the important thing about this internal cavity is that it defines the head-to-tail axis of the animal, the anterior-to-posterior axis. As with earlier stages of development, the sea urchin provides a convenient model organism for studying how gastrulation proceeds. To picture gastrulation, Imagine again that our developing organism is something like a small globe with an animal pole at the top and a vegetal pole at the bottom, but now we're thinking of the globe as being made out of a hollow ball of cells. Gastrulation in sea urchins begins at the vegetal pole, where the cells of the, that are found there flatten out and form a plate. This is technically called the vegetal plate. Now, a number of the cells from the region of the vegetal plate, these are called mesenchyme cells, detach from the blastoderm. They de detach from this layer of cells that's forming the ball and actually crawl into the inside of the, uh, of the ball. They actually crawl into the blastocele. The next thing that happens is that the cells of the vegetal plate itself, these are cells of what we call the blastoderm, begin to buckle inwards. Now, the way to think about this is that it's as though you had kind of a squishy hollow ball and, and a thumb was stuck in from the bottom. You can imagine that as you stick your thumb into the bottom of that ball, you distend that, that surface of the ball so that it now begins to push inside. The cells themselves are what are changing shape here, as I mentioned last time. It's not that there's any thumb pushing them in, they're kind of just distending in, but it looks the same. This inward extending sheet of cells from the vegetal plate continues to press inward, forming a deep pouch inside the ball. This deep pouch is connected to the outside by a small hole, well, a hole where those cells first started pushing in. The inward extension technically, is called the archenteron. Basically, that means the primitive gut. And the hole connecting it to the outside is called the blastopore. Okay. Now, the closed end of the archenteron extends all the way through the center of that ball and eventually connects up with the other side, forming a second opening. Again, if you sort of think of a, of a squishy hollow ball and you pushed your thumb in, if you push it far enough, you're going to actually push that extension you're making into the ball all the way until it touches the other side. Approximately the other side, not necessarily exactly the other side. And when it touches the other side, a second opening forms where it touches. At this stage, what we have is now a much more complex structure. We have a structure that has um, not just one layer, as we had before, but actually three distinctive cell layers. Let's think about this for, uh, for a second. The outermost layer is what we'll now call the ectoderm. 
The ectoderm is composed of those cells that were in the original blastoderm, the original single-layered hollow ball, that are still on the outside. They're not ones that either migrated in or were pushed in by our imaginary thumb. The innermost layer of this now three-layered structure we'll call the endoderm. This is the layer that was actually formed when we pushed our thumb inside that cell. So in other words, we created another, inside that ball I mean, we created another layer of cells that is essentially that group of, that, that, that layer of tissue that got pushed in and eventually formed the inside of the tube that extended all the way across. Finally, the third layer that we have we call the mesoderm. The mesoderm is located in between the ectoderm on the outermost surface and the endoderm on the innermost surface, so mesoderm, the middle layer. The cells of the mesoderm come from those mesenchyme cells that I mentioned before, the cells that originally detached and just crawled into the inside of the blastocele. Again, imagine our hollow ball and imagine that there are some cells just floating around in the middle as we are pushing our thumb through. As we push our thumb through and cause that tube to be formed through that hollow ball, now those cells that were in the middle are essentially trapped, if you will. They're not really trapped. They're just located in between the outermost and the innermost layer. Those cells proliferate and become the mesoderm. These three layers which are also called the embryonic germ layers, give rise to distinctly different kinds of tissues in the adult organism. And in a sense, what we've done now is develop three layers that is the beginning of establishing the fates of entire groups of cells. Let's shift away from sea urchins now and consider what these germ layers give rise to, just for example, in humans and other vertebrate animals, because this provides a more familiar reference point. The ectoderm, for example, not surprisingly, gives rise to the outer layer of our skin, what we would call the epidermis, and derivatives of the epidermis, such as hair or nails. The ectodermal layer eventually, as the organism develops, also gives rise, as it turns out, to much of our nervous system. It gives rise to the lining on the inside of our mouths, to the cornea and lens of our eyes. Um, Many of the glands that are associated with the skin, such as sweat glands or oil glands or mammary glands. The mesodermal tissue gives rise to our skeletal system, to our muscles, to the circulatory system, to gonads, and to some other organs such as kidneys and the heart. The endoderm gives rise to the inner linings of our digestive system. Again, not surprising because the endoderm was form, forming that primitive digestive system, the archenteron. It also gives rise to other internal organs such as the liver or the pancreas or the urinary bladder. Now, with gastrulation, we have in place the most basic ground plan of the whole organism. The basic body plan not only has these three cell layers or germ layers developed or defined, it also has the head-to-tail axis defined by the relative positions of the two holes of that primitive gut that, were found, that was formed. But we're still a pretty far cry from anything that looks remotely like an adult organism. Gastrulation has lift, left us with a head-to-tail uh, orientation, and it's also left us with the three germ layers. But now, how do we get from there to anything that might start to have the real complexity of an organism? Well, the formation of other kinds of structures, such as rudimentary limbs, or appendages or other organs that follows the stage of gastrulation and occurs very early on is what we call in general organogenesis, the generation of organs. Now the specific events that occurred in organogenesis in terms of shape changes and so forth obviously differ radically from animal to animal because of course this is what ultimately gives rise to all of the different shapes and structures that characterize different kinds of animals. But again, in spite of this diversity, this process of organ organogenesis really all can be laid to just a few kinds of morphogenetic movements, or a few types of morphogenetic movements, especially involving the folding and bending of those three original embryonic tissue layers, the ones that were established in gastrulation. To get an idea of what I mean by this, let's picture one more time our embryo 
now just after gastrulation has uh, finished. Remember, we started with a hollow ball. Now we've got a ball that's got a tube running through it with three layers defined. Actually, by this point, the embryo isn't really a ball. In fact, in most organisms, it's, it's, other than sea urchins, it's rarely really like a ball. But in most organisms, it's better to picture the embryo at this stage as sort of like a tube. Imagine that ball has kind of gotten elongated along the head-to-tail axis, you know, more worm-like than ball-like. Now, take that tube and slice it in cross-section in your mind. If you did this, what you'd see, if you looked on the end of where you'd slice in the cross-section, you would see these three basic cell layers that I described. Ectoderm on the outside, mesoderm in the middle, endoderm forming uh, the, inner, the inside, the tube of the uh, primitive digestive system. What organ organogenesis essentially does is um, use movements of cells to twist around these different layers, creating outpocketings or evaginations or inpocketings, which we would call invaginations, to change the relative shape of those basic germ layers and create essentially internal structure. Let me give you an example that is really one of the first things that happens in organogenesis in vertebrate animals, and that's the formation of what we would call the neural tube. Now, the neural tube is what eventually will give rise to the rest of the nervous system, the spinal cord and the brain in vertebrates. If we look very early on, just after gastrulation, what we would see is that part of the ectoderm, the part of the ectoderm along, running along that tube of the part that would eventually become the back of the animal, begins to bend in. It begins to push inward and form what's essentially a groove alongside that tube. Again, if you're looking at cross-section, you'd see kind of inward indentation. If you're looking at the whole embryo, you'd see a groove running along the long axis. That groove continues to push in because of morphogenetic cell movements of the cells of that part of the ectoderm until finally it pushes in so much that the edges of that groove bend over on top of each other, coming together over the groove and the ceiling essentially forming now a second tube that runs along the long axis of the organism. That second tube, the first tube being the tube that was defined by the endoderm running along the axis of the primitive gut, that second tube will specialize and differentiate and again change its shape eventually in many ways to become elements of the nervous system. Similar invaginations and evaginations set up the development of all sorts of other kinds of structure. Outpocketings of the mesoderm, for example, will eventually bud off and give rise to things like the kidneys and the heart, while, again, outpocketings pushing outward of the endoderm is what gives rise to the structure of the lungs. Now, you can imagine that the lungs are a pretty complex kind of outpocketing eventually, but the very origin of the lungs begins with this piece of endoderm, a part of endoderm somewhere along the axis starting to outpocket, starting to form a bulge outward that will eventually turn in to what are the lungs. The point here is that the end of the, some further period of development, our cross-section of these three layers becomes much more complicated as there is a continual process of invagination and evagination involving morphogenetic uh, movements that uh, cause the initial germ layers to give rise to increasingly more complex internal and external structures. We'll see in a later um, lecture actually that um, from the ectoderm along certain positions of the ectoderm, little um, evaginations, outpocketings, eventually will form what we call limb buds, and these will extend out and form the limbs of a vertebrate such as ourselves. The take-home message here is that we've essentially got a simple process, morphogenetic movement, repeated over and over again with these basic germ layers, creating the rudiments of all of the complex organisms, appendages, and other structures of a complex animal body. Now, the generic organism whose development I've described so far is really a fictional composite drawn from model organisms as diverse as sea urchins, frogs, and humans. If we were to study in detail the development of any one particular organism, we could spend an equal amount of time describing differences from the basic outline I pre presented. But the value of this description is that it lays out the general features of development that we have to account for.
We have to figure out what it is that causes the emergence of these structures and the eventual specialization of these structures in such a highly regulated way. How do cells know what kinds of more specific tissues they should eventually turn into? How do they know when and where to move? That is, what determines the fate of cells in an embryo? We'll begin to address these kinds of questions in our next lecture.